Hi, welcome back. In this session, I'd like to take financial ratios and apply them to real companies so that you can see how the numbers play out. Before I do that though, I'm going to use a familiar technique. I'm going to use a corporate life cycle to illustrate what happens to different ratios as companies age. Take profit margins. When companies are very young, you should expect to see perhaps positive gross margins, but negative margins on every other dimension, negative operating margins, negative net margins. As companies grow, first thing that's going to turn positive are their operating margins. And then as they become more mature, net margins will turn positive as well. Now, when you look at accounting returns, you'll see the same phenomenon play out. Young companies will often have negative accounting returns or accounting returns that cannot even be computed because something is not available, like invested capital. As companies mature, those negative accounting returns will become positive. As companies reach their peak, these accounting returns will also peak. And when they become mature companies, they'll defend that accounting return. They're going to decline, accounting returns will decline. And finally, when you look at debt ratios, if you're a young company, you generally should not have debt. In fact, high debt ratios of young companies are toxic. They can put the company under. But as companies mature, those debt ratios will start to show up, especially in the later stages of young growth. And then as companies mature, debt ratios will drive. And then in decline, if the company does the right thing, debt ratios should decline as the company goes out of business. So you should expect ratios to change over the life cycle of a company. Now, to give this uh, concept some basis, I'm going to compute profitability, profit margins across six different companies. Six companies we've used on other se uh, in the other sessions as well, Peloton, Netflix, Coca-Cola, Toyota, Total, and Dr. Reddy's. With each one, I've computed gross margin, operating margin, after-tax operating margin, and net margin. I've also computed an effective tax rate from, if you remember in the income statements, I reminded divided taxes by taxable income. To compute the after-tax operating margin, I use the effective tax rate on the operating income. Now take a look at those numbers. If you look at the gross margin, for instance, Dr. Reddy says a gross margin of close to 80%. Whereas if you look at Toyota and Total, their gross margins are much lower. Peloton also has low gross margin, but that might be a reflection of the youth of the company. Remember, it's a young company going public. Now, if you look across these companies, the first thing that jumps out to me is one is life cycle matters. Younger companies, if you look at Peloton, has a, has a positive gross margin, but negative operating and negative net margins. As companies age, margins change. But there's also a business difference, which is some businesses, by the nature of the business, will have higher costs and lower operating margins. Take Toyota. You have to make a car. It's going to cost a lot more than it costs Coca-Cola to make an extra bottle of soda. Because remember, the syrup costs very little. The bottles cost very little. The primary expense for Coca-Cola is a marketing expense. So companies like Coca-Cola and Dr. Reddy's will have much higher operating margins than companies like Toyota and Total. doesn't make one company better than the other. The business differences. And if you look at the difference in operating and net margin, it's usually associated with debt. Now, none of my six companies had dramatically large amounts of debt, but if you have a company with a lot of debt, you should expect to see net margins be lower than operating margins. So just re to revert back again, you can see this play out. Peloton has positive gross margins, negative everything else, and as companies age, those margins improve. And maybe one of the things to watch in Netflix would be how that margin changes over time as the company goes from growth to maturity. Let's move on to accounting returns. Again, for all six of my companies, I computed a return in equity, where I divide net income by book equity, and I'm staying with the accounting measure of book equity with all of its limitations. I also took after-tax operating income and divided by invested capital. Remember, invested capital is book equity plus debt minus cash. In 2019, you now if you look at the accounting changing, the debt does include lease commitments converted to debt. Pre-2019, I might have had to do it myself. Now, if I look at the returns in equity, you can see the wide divergence again. Peloton has a negative return in equity, minus 79%. Why? Because it's losing money and has very little shareholders' equity. As the companies mature, the return in equity does change. Netflix and Coca-Cola have the highest returns in equity, reflecting the fact that they're both, that net, for Netflix, that it's a growth company, and for Coca-Cola, that it's a business with substantial competitive advantages to the company. 
third and total of single digit returns in equity. And Dr. Reddy's the return equity bounces back again. If you look at return invested capital, you see the same pattern play out. Netflix and Coca-Cola have the highest returns in capital. Toyota and Total are much lower, and Dr. Reddy's is high. And for Peloton, invested capital becomes a negative number. Why? Because the cash actually exceeds the book equity plus debt. Now, as with um, as with margins, there are difference. The, the differences come from multiple places. With accounting returns, there's an economic rationale for why some companies have high accounting returns and others don't. To the extent that accounting re returns measure true economic returns, companies with significant competitive advantages, barriers to entry, should have much higher returns than companies with much lower barriers to entry. Why? Because if you make a high return, competition comes in. It pushes the returns down. So maybe Total and Toyota, the low returns reflect the fact that they're in much more competitive businesses. But there's also an accounting issue, right? These are accounting numbers and accounting choices affect these numbers. Take Dr. Reddy's labs. I've taken the shareholders equity and invested capital that's on the balance sheet. But remember, R&D is the biggest capital expense for a pharmaceutical company. And we talked about how accountants tr mistreat R&D, that because they treat R&D as an operating expense, they keep the biggest assets off the books. Now, I'm not going to push this further, but later we'll talk about how, how much of a difference this makes. But if you took Dr. Reddy's, maybe the return on capital is overstated because R&D is being mistreated. So remember again, when you compute accounting returns, it's a joint effect. Some of it comes from the economics of the business. Some of it comes from accounting choices. Let's move on to efficiency ratios. I've divided revenues by both total assets and invested capital. I prefer the sales to invested capital ratio because it ties in more closely to how I measure things in finance, but there's nothing wrong with using an asset turnover ratio. Again, remember how you read this ratio. The higher this number is, the more efficiently this company is generating revenues. With sales to invested capital, for instance, Netflix is the most efficient of my companies in terms of delivering revenues. It delivers $1.7 in revenues for every dollar of invested capital. What does that mean? Holding all its constant to grow its revenues, Netflix has to reinvest less money than the other companies in my grouping. But even 1.71 is not a high number. There are businesses where this number can be as high as five, seven, or 10. These are very capital light businesses, but sales to invested capital gives you a measure of how much a company has to invest to get the revenues that you want it to get. Now, when you look at efficiency ratios, what we're trying to capture is what I call the dark side of growth. You say, what do you mean dark side of growth? Growth is a good thing. Yeah, it is true. Growth has a good side. It makes your earnings, your revenue scale up, but it does have a dark side, which is to get that scaling up, you've got to invest money. Efficiency ratios measure that dark side. It measures how much you have to put into a business to make it grow. Later in, the, in my corporate finance and valuation classes, I'll argue that growth is not necessarily a good that it can add value, destroy value, or do nothing for value. And one of the things we're going to trade off against a good side of growth is how much you need to reinvest. The second is the sales to invested capital and sales to asset ratios also give you a measure of scaling up. I mean, in the last 20 years, we've seen some of the great companies that we face today. These are companies that seem to be able to scale up with much less effort, much less capital. And as you look at this, these ratios, a couple of things to factor in. One is how this ratio will change as you go from young to old. Remember for Netflix, I said sales to invested capital is 1.71. Five years ago, that number was 1.5. As Netflix is growing, it seems to be becoming more efficient in how much it revenues it generates for dollar of capital. Maybe, as, as, at least in this business, in Netflix's business, as companies scale up, it gets a little easier to add revenues. That's not always true. So that's something you might have to make a judgment on depending on the business you're in. The second is, and I've pointed this out, the accounting choices kind of contaminate these ratios. So be willing to question what accountants do to make sure it's not just an accounting artifact. Let's talk about debt ratios. Here, I have multiple measures of debt ratios. I look at long-term debt, total debt, net debt, and I look at market equity, book equity. Now, if you look at the ratios of computer debt to equity and debt to capital, both book and market, I'll make a confession. When I went from book to market, I did replace book equity with market equity, but I left book debt as market debt. 
I'm being a little sloppy here because we still haven't talked about how to convert book debt easily into market debt. But my defense is book equity and market equity can be very different numbers, but book debt and market debt should be pretty close. Now, as you look at those book and market ratios, you can see the differences across companies. Let's take the two companies which have more than 100% as a debt to equity ratio. They have more than a dollar of debt for every dollar of equity. Netflix has a debt to equity ratio of 195% and Toyota is a debt to equity ratio of 106%. Freaks you out, right? That seems like a really high debt ratio. But look at Netflix's market debt to equity ratio. It's about 7%. Toyota, on the other hand, the market debt to equity ratio is almost equal to its book debt to equity. You're saying, why is that? Very simply, if you compare the book equity and the market equity for Netflix and Toyota, you can see the wild divergence, right? The accountants tell me the equity in Netflix is worth 7.6 billion. The market's telling me it's worth 216 billion. You know what? I trust the market more than accountants on this one. For Toyota, the two numbers are much closer. The book and market ratios deliver very different messages for, Toyota, for Netflix, but very similar messages for Toyota. Now, if you look at Dr. Reddy's, very little debt, no matter how you define it. Again, you can see the shop when you look at debt to EBITDA. Dr. Reddy's has very little debt, whether I define it as gross debt or net debt, debt to capital or debt to EBITDA. Dr. Reddy's borrows very little money. In fact, very few, none of my six companies are tremendously levered companies, but even with these six companies, you can see the divergences in how much debt they have. Toyota is the most debt among my companies. It shows up both as a high debt to equity or debt to capital ratio, and also as debt to EBITDA. So when you look at debt, the reason we, again, look at debt uh, and, and these debt ratios is debt is a double-edged sword. Many, many companies around the world borrow money because they claim it's cheaper than equity. It's kind of an inherently dangerous reason to borrow. We'll come back and address whether that's true. But when you borrow money, you also create a risk that you will not be able to make those debt payments. You create the likelihood of distress. So debt is a trade-off between the tax benefits that come from borrowing and the distress risk. One of the ways to measure the distress, distress risk is to look at these debt ratios. The second is when you look at debt ratios, you have to make sure that you understand how the debt is computed. Is gross or net? Is it market or book? And those choices can affect what you see as debt ratios. I never use debt ratios from services, not because I believe these services are wrong, but because I often don't see the transparency. I will need to be sure that the debt ratio is what I wanted to measure. My advice to you is when you have to compute the debt ratio for a company, do it yourself. You don't need capital IQ or fax it to tell you what the debt ratio is. All you have to do is divide one number by another number. Which brings me to my final sets of ratios, coverage and liquidity ratios. I've computed both interest uh, coverage and fixed charge coverage ratios in the first set of numbers. And you can see again the divergence across the companies. Dr. Reddy's looks really good in an interest coverage ratio and a fixed charge because it has very little debt. Toyota has a surprisingly high interest coverage ratio given how much money it's borrowed, but fixed charge ratio shows it to be more risky. With Netflix, the interest coverage ratio and the fixed charge coverage ratio both deliver a pretty neutral message. Netflix is under no risk on, on either dimension. And with Coca-Cola, the interest coverage and the fixed charge ratios are very different. One of the problems with fixed charge coverage ratios is since we're often adding debt payments to fixed charges, those debt payments tend to be lumpy. They're high in some years, low in others. So look at a company like Coca-Cola, I'm inclined to believe that there's relatively little risk in Coca-Cola. The interest coverage ratio gives me a truer measure of distress risk than looking at the fixed charge coverage ratio. So be cautious about how you read these ratios because unless you understand what goes into them, you might be getting the wrong message from them. I've also computed current ratios and quick ratios for these companies. And if you look at those current and quick ratios, supposedly they give you a measure of short-term risk. And I'll be open and, and honest with you. I find these current and quick ratios are very little use for the companies that we look at today. Maybe they were much more useful 50 or 100 years ago. But I don't believe that a high current ratio is an indication of low risk. In fact, in many cases, I think high current ratios are deadly to companies from a valuation perspective. But if you look at the difference in current and quick ratios, I'm not sure what to read into them. But they reflect where these companies are right now.
So here's the bottom line. When you look at um, when you look at companies you, and, and you look at this, uh, you might think you're safe by looking at interest and fixed charge coverage ratios. But remember, I'm using last year's operating income as my base. If you're looking at a company where income is volatile, that could be dangerous, right? You could be just looking at a really good year and making a misjudgment about the company. But there's a fix for that. If you're worried that 2019 was a really good year or an unusually good year, here's what you should do. Look at the average across time. You're saying, and that's called normalization, a fancy word for I'm looking across time. So if you're looking at uh, companies and volatile businesses, this might just mean using average income over the last five years. For young companies, normalization is messier because normalization will come as the company scale up, in which case you have to decide what Peloton will look like two years from now, or five years from now. There's no way around it, but you've got to be willing to make that judgment. So here's the bottom line. Financial ratios can be useful, but my advice is less is more. When I see tables with 50, 100 ratios computed, I see noise. If you decide to use financial ratios, pick and choose the ratios that you feel best measure your businesses and just stick with them. Don't have a dozen measures of, of profit margin. Pick your preferred measure of profit margin and use it. Remember also ratios are a means to an end. They're not an end by themselves. So when you do ratio analysis, it's because you want to understand what your company does well, what it does ba badly, what its dangers are, what, what its opportunities are. Your, your job is to take ratios and frame a story for your company. And that story is, has to be about the future. Remember, the past is the past. You can't go back and change it. There's no point assessing ratios for the last 10 years over and over. Your job is to take the ratios over the last 10 years and tell you what they tell you about the future. Keep your focus on the future. So as you look at companies, there's no harm in computing ratios as long as you remember they're your tools. Your tools to make a judgment for a company to advance your financial analysis, not numbers that should just stand on their own. I hope you found this session useful and I thank you for listening.